So in this video, I'm going to run through making salts with a specific focus on titrations. Uh, so titrations come up in SC14 um, and they're a really important part of that topic and are therefore going to be an important part of your exam next week. So if you're making a salt, you're going to react an acid and a base. You make a salt and you also make water. Acids are always dissolved in water, so they always have the state symbol AQ. However, a base can sometimes dissolve in water, giving it the state symbol AQ. However, in other cases, the base is insoluble and it's a solid that does not dissolve. When that base dissolves and is aqueous, we can call the base an alkali. When it remains a solid, there's no special name for it. We just keep calling it a base. So because there are two different forms of the base, a solid base and a base that dissolves in water, we've got two different methods for making a salt. The first method we're going to look at very briefly is the method where you react an acid with a solid base. So if we have a look down here, I have got my, my acid in a beaker. As we said, acids are always going to be in liquid form. So you can see I've drawn my acid as a liquid and I've got my base that is a solid. If I add some of the base to the acid, you will see it disappearing. Now we just said that this base is a solid because it does not dissolve in water. So what's actually happening when you add the base to the acid, the base reacts with the acid to form salt and water. So the base is reacting, it's becoming something else, it's becoming salt and water, therefore you see that base disappear. You keep adding the base until all of the acid has reacted. How will you know when all of the acid has reacted? Well, when all of the acid is gone, the base has nothing to react with. And when it has nothing to react with, it's going to stay solid. Okay, remember, it doesn't dissolve in water. So without any acid to react with, that base is going to remain solid. And then you will know that you've added enough base. So what you've got here is you don't have acid anymore. All of the acid has reacted. You've just got salt and water. And you've got some leftover base that sits as a solid at the bottom of the beaker. The aim is to get pure salt. At the moment, you've got salt, water, and unreacted base in your beaker. You're gonna to need to separate those. The first thing you're gonna do is remove the unreacted base. Because it's a solid and you wanna remove it from a liquid, you are going to use a filter. So you pass this through the filter. The unreacted base as a solid will stay in the filter funnel. The salt and the water will pass through. To separate the salt from the water, you would then need to heat the solution to evaporate some of the water and then leave the salt to crystallize. Okay, so in this method, because I'm adding a solid to a liquid, when I add too much, it's not a problem because I can easily remove that solid, that unreacted base from my solution. However, if my base was in liquid form and I was adding it to the acid, if I added too much, I would not easily be able to remove that unreacted base. I can only remove it because it's a solid. If it was a liquid, I wouldn't be able to remove it and I would end up with salt, water, and lots of extra base. Therefore, I wouldn't be able to get a pure salt. So when we are using this method, when we're using the acid and the alkali, we use a completely different method and that method is called a titration. And in this method, you use a glass instrument called a burette. And it's a long, thin piece of glassware. And you place your acid in a burette. And there's a tap at the end of this burette. And then into a conical flask, you will place the alkali and you will also include an indicator. So there's a few differences that I just wanna run through and then we'll look at how to answer exam questions on titrations, okay? So the reason you're putting an acid into a burette is you want to add the acid in exactly the right amount to fully neutralize the alkali and form salt and water, but without adding any extra acid because you wouldn't be able to get rid of it. Okay, it has to be in exactly the right amount. So because I want to add it in the right amount, I use this piece of equipment called the burette because I've got a little tap at the bottom and it allows me to add the acid really, really slowly. In the previous experiment, we knew that the reaction was done because the base stopped dissolving and remained solid. In this case, I need to use an indicator to tell me when the reaction is done. And the typical indicator I would use would be phenolphthalene or methyl orange. And I place a little bit of phenolphthalene here in with the alkali. It will be pink 
and when the reaction is complete, it will turn colourless. So I'm going to flip over the page and look at how to answer a six mark question on a titration, all of the important information that you would need. So this is what the question might look like. How do you obtain a pure salt from an acid and an alkali? And the fact that they're saying alkali there means you're going to need to use a titration. Although to be fair, in the question they do usually tell you that they want you to do a titration, so it's pretty obvious. First step, and you can write in bullet points, okay, you do get marked on these six mark questions um, for your for your kind of your explanation, but that doesn't mean you can't use bullet points, it just means that you have to you have to sequence them in a logical order. So you can have clear and effective written communication using bullet points. That's absolutely fine. So you're going to place the acid in the burette. You need to mention the word burette because you get marks for using um, the appropriate equipment. And you're always, well, to be fair, you can do it either way, but we're going to say for this case that we put the acid in the burette. You are then going to use what we call a pipette, and I'll run through the difference between a burette and a pipette in a moment. You're going to use a pipette to measure out the amount of alkali, and you're going to put that into a conical flask. You need to mention both of those pieces of glassware. And as well as having the alkali in the conical flask, you're also going to put in a few drops of indicator, and I have chosen phenolphthalein. You then add the acid from the burette until the colour changes from pink to colourless. So because I'm using phenolphthalein, the colour change I'm going to see is pink to colourless. Once you've done that, you note how much acid you have to add in order to see the colour change, and then you repeat until you've got three almost identical volumes. Once you've got your almost identical volumes and you know exactly how much acid is required to um, neutralize that alkali, you're going to repeat the titration without your indicator. Okay. The reason you remove the indicator is that indicator will contaminate your salt. Remember, the aim of this is to get a pure salt. If you use an indicator, you won't be able to remove it. You won't have a pure salt. So once you know exactly how much acid you need to add, you don't need that indicator anymore and you repeat without it. And that step there, often overlooked, very important. You repeat without the indicator. Once you've done that, and you've added exactly the right amount of acid to the alkali without any indicator, all you should be left with is just the salt and the water. There's, there's nothing else there because all of the acid has reacted and all of the alkali has reacted because you've added them in exactly the right quantities. You've just got salt and water. To separate that salt and water, it's the same as before. You're going to heat to evaporate some of the water. Then you're going to leave that to cool and leave those crystals to dry. Now, in this six mark question, I mean, there's a few other things that you could include if you wanted to, but this would get you a full six marks. And a few things I want to point out that are very important is to mention the burette and to mention the pipette. Okay, you need to mention the appropriate glassware. And in the case of titration, that's a burette and a pipette. Now, technically, you can do this the other way around and do acid and pipette and alkali and burette, but then the colour changes are going to change as well. So I would just stick with this way. The acid goes in the burette, use the pipette to measure the alkali. You can use a different indicator. You can use methyl orange instead of phenolphthalein, but you cannot use universal. The reason is you need a sharp colour change. So with phenolphthalein, it goes from pink to colourless. One quick, sharp colour change. If you use universal indicator, it will start off as purple in an alkali, and then it will go bluey, and then it will start to go greeny, and it'll be really hard to see when the reaction is actually complete because it gradually changes colour. So you use phenolphthalein or you use methyl orange, whichever one you're more comfortable with, but make sure that you know the associated colour change and do not use universal. Also, do not use litmus. If you're using phenolphthalein, you need to have a rough idea of how to spell it, okay? You can spell it slightly wrong and still get the mark, but it should look very similar to the word phenolphthalein, okay? Um, blah, 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 blah. I'll go through this in a little more detail in a minute. Um, you have to mention this point here that I've underlined. That's typically where students lose marks. If you don't remove the indicator, then you don't end up with a pure salt. The last thing to add here is often students get to this point and then they just say crystallization and they don't describe how that process works. You have to describe how you separate the water from the salt. Don't just say heat to evaporate. What are you evaporating? You're not evaporating the salt, you're just evaporating the water. You don't evaporate all of the water immediately, 
because you'll end up with just kind of a mush. Okay, you evaporate some of the water and then you let the rest of it evaporate slowly over time. You let, let your crystals cool, you let your crystals dry. You want all of that water gone, but you want the rest of the water to evaporate quite slowly. So make sure you're describing this last part in detail. You cannot get six marks if you don't develop your explanation of the crystallization process. You can be asked to write out a six mark, okay? That will always get you six marks every single time, okay? In the question, they might have given you a specific acid or a specific alkali, doesn't matter. You can still just write that and you'll get your full six marks. But the other thing they can do is they can ask you a few questions about the titration and that's what we're going to look at now. So they can ask you about the burette and about the pipette. So I have drawn, rather crudely, the burette and the pipette here below. So this is the burette, this is where we said we're going to put the acid, and this is the pipette, the device we're going to use to measure the alkali. In terms of why we use these specific pieces of glassware, it's because they're very accurate. With the burette, that's easy to see. You've got lots of what we call graduations on the side of the burette, which means you can read the volume to one decimal place. If you compare a burette to a, a beaker, if I had a beaker and I had one line there for 100 mils and one line here for 50 mils, and I had a volume that sat around there, you'd be guessing, you'd be saying, mm, that looks like around about 75 mils, but it's not accurate. On the burette, because you've got lots of graduations, these lines are called graduations, you can read the volume very accurately. The other advantage of the burette is the tap. You want to add the acid slowly so that you don't add too much. If you're pouring freehand, you're gonna add more than what you intend, so having that tap, means you add the acid slowly, it gives you control. With the pipette, all you really need to know with the pipette is that, again, it's a very accurate piece of glassware. On the, on the pipette, you actually only have one, one line. Uh, so you build, you have a pipette specific, and it's typically to measure out 25 mils, which is the same as 25 centimeters cubed. So you can get 20 mil pipettes or 25 mil pipettes. And the only volume that they are used to measure is that 25 mil volume, but they're calibrated that they do it incredibly accurately. So that you just need to know that they're a very accurate piece of glassware, and that's why we use it for the alkali, so we know exactly how much alkali we've got in our conical flask. In, in terms of how you use it, can you can be asked about this as well. When you're setting up the burette, you typically rinse it with acid first. And the reason you do this is because if there's any water left in the burette from maybe the last time you cleaned it, any water left over would dilute your acid when you add the acid in for the experiment. So what you do is you open the tap and you just pour some acid through, you'll, you'll collect it with a beaker at the bottom, you pour some acid through and then any water that's left in your burette will be removed with the acid that your burette is about to contain. So you're gonna rinse it through with acid. When you're reading the burette as well, you're gonna read it at eye level. So you're gonna crouch down to eye level and just say the volume of the burette is here. Because the burette is so narrow, instead of getting a straight line for the volume like I had here in my beaker, you get this little kind of curve. And that curve is called the meniscus. And you always read from the bottom of the meniscus. So if they ask you how to use the burette, you'll read the volume at eye level, you'll crouch right down, and you'll look where the bottom of the meniscus sits. That's how you read it accurately. With the pipette, in terms of using it, you have to actually be able to fill it. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a straw because it's open on both ends and there's no tap like the burette. So you can't just pour it in from above or it'll just go the whole way through. So what you use is what's called a pipette filler. It's a suction device that you attach to the top of the pipette and you use that to draw liquid up into the pipette. You draw the liquid right up to this mark, again, making sure that you've got the bottom of the meniscus sitting on that mark, and then you take it and you release the liquid into your conical flask. Again, before using it, if it's about to contain an alkali, you will rinse with that same alkali. So if it's gonna contain sodium hydroxide, you'll rinse with the sodium hydroxide first. And again, the reason any water that's in that pipette will dilute your sodium hydroxide, you want to remove any water. There is a, you're supposed to use proper pipette fillers, but there's a thing called mouth pipetting, where you basically use the pipette as a straw and you like suck the alkali up into the pipette. Now that is obviously dangerous 
So if they ask you why you need to use a pipette filler, it's because a mouth pipetting is, is, is very dangerous, okay? You might suck too much of the alkali and it could enter your mouth. Obviously, we're not supposed to be drinking these chemicals. So mouth pipetting is not a good idea. You need to use a pipette filler. There is a question, one of the exam questions that I gave you that ask you about the use of the burette and ask you about the use of the pipette. So I have provided you with these exam questions and the mark scheme. So the question is here. It's question 20, so you do have the mark schemes. Uh, describe how the pipette should be used to measure exactly 25 centimeters cubed. It's for two marks. You get one mark for saying use the pipette filler and you also get a mark for saying make sure the bottom of the meniscus is on the line or you can say that you rinse with the alkali first. So there's three things you can say, any two of them will get you your marks. Then why do you wash the burette, sorry, you first washed it with water and then you rinse it with some of the acid. Why do you do that? Because the water would dilute the acid, so you rinse it with the acid to remove any water. Okay, so they're your classic questions about the burette and the pipette. If they ask you why you use them, it's because they're so accurate. The other thing that you can be asked about in terms of the titration is just in terms of the indicator, which we kind of covered already. So why do you use phenophthalene or methyl orange? Because they've got a sharp color change. Why do you not use universal? Because it's got a gradual color change or universal does not have a sharp color change. You can sometimes put a white tile under the conical flask. That's just to see the color change better. Why do you repeat it at the end without the indicator? You're trying to get a pure salt. The indicator will contaminate the salt. You'd have no way of removing that indicator. So once you know exactly how much acid is required, you do it again without the indicator. When you're repeating those titrations, you are trying to get what we call concordant results. And concordant results are results that are within 0.1 mils of each other. And they can sometimes give you a table and ask you to calculate the average. Now, your instinct might be to add these four numbers together and divide by four. But before you do that, you need to go through the four results and see which of them are concordant, which of them are within 0.1 mils. The other thing to note is the first titer is also called the rough titer. It's the very first titration you do. Because it's the first titration you do and you don't know where the end point is going to be, it's typically not very accurate. So we always discard the rough titer and we don't include it when we're getting the average. I now need to look at titers 2, 3 and 4 and see which are within 0.1 mils. Well, you might notice with titer 3 that instead of having it to 0.1 decimal places, I just have it as 23. Therefore, again, I cannot use that volume. If they wrote it as 23.0 and the 0.0 was within 0.1, then that's fine. But because they've just written it as 23 and they haven't recorded it accurately, I again need to discount that titer. I'm not going to include it. The last two I'm left with, 22.6, 22.7, they're both to one decimal place, neither of them is the rough titer, and they're within 0.1 mils of each other. Therefore, when I'm calculating my average, these are the two results that I'm going to use, and I get an answer of 22.65, okay? So you need to do it a couple of times in order to make sure you've got concordant results. Um, here is an example, it's the last thing, an example of a question that they asked you. So they gave you the full method for the titration, but then they asked for two things that you could do to make it more accurate. And when students were answering this question, a lot of them focused on doing the titration again. That doesn't make it more accurate, okay? If you were doing the titration kind of clumsily, if you were just using a beaker for your acid, um, doing it five times isn't going to give you accurate results. So doing it multiple times make you, makes your results more reliable, but if you're doing it badly, it's not gonna make your results more accurate. So that was the common mistake that people made there. They talked about doing it again to make it more accurate, and that's not acceptable. The things that were acceptable, if I flick to the mark scheme, lots of stuff that you could say, but for each thing you said, you have to say why it would make it more accurate. So you can talk about the burette and the pipette. Reading from the bottom of the meniscus, you get a more accurate volume. You can talk about adding the acid dropwise using your tap 
because you can identify exactly when the color change takes place using a white tile to make it easier to see. But each thing that you each thing that you're mentioning to say it makes it more accurate, you have to explain why it makes it more accurate. Down here, do not award marks for concordancy reliability. Okay, you're doing it multiple times. It doesn't necessarily make it more accurate. We do that to make sure our, our results are uh, reliable. But if you're doing it badly each time it's not going to be more accurate. You can also talk about washing the pipe burette and the pipette, just like we talked about. So with the titration, you're definitely going to be assessed. You'll either get like a six mark question where you just asked to write out the method of the titration, or you're going to be asked a series of short questions asking you about the burette, the pipette, how we do it accurately, why we use the indicators we do, you know, calculating the mean volume. You can also be asked about safety. Obviously, you're working with an acid and an alkali, so you're going to want to wear goggles, uh, stop it getting into your eye. You're going to want to maybe wear gloves um, if, if the acid is corrosive, stop it getting on your skin. Okay, so they are your typical titration questions, and you definitely need to know them. There's also the titration calculation. I've made a separate video up for that in SC14. Uh, so go and watch that separate video if you need help with the titration calculations.